welcome or welcome back to my channel. I just finished watching Sandy Tin season one for the very first time. A chance accident brings Charlotte Haywood to Sandy Tin, a seaside resort on the cusp of dramatic change. Spirited and unconventional, Charlotte is initially keen to experience everything the town has to offer but is then shocked by its scheming and ambitious inhabitants and intrigued by the secrets they share. When Charlotte is tactlessly forthright about the family of enthusiastic entrepreneur Tom Parker, she immediately clashes with his handsome but wild younger brother Sidney. Amidst the rival suitors and unexpected danger, can Charlotte and Sidney see past each other's flaws and find love? The thing is, I knew what was coming. I knew it was going to hurt so bad. And it hurt so much worse than I thought it would. <sighs> I'll be honest, it was not a fun time. I mean, I enjoyed the show, but it, <laughs> it was not a blast. <laughs> like, two words, emotional damage. I have notes from every single episode. I'm going to try and run through them quickly, okay? Episode 1. We meet Tom and Mary Parker. Their carriage crashes outside the Haywood home. The Haywoods take them in and help them, and they are so grateful that they invite Mr. Haywood to their town, Sandyton, and to their brand new resort, which is currently being built. Mr. Haywood doesn't want to leave his family or his job, but he allows his daughter Charlotte to accept the invitation because this small town where she's from is all she's ever known and she really does have a spirit of adventure. She wants to travel, so this opportunity is very exciting to her. Quick note, Tom Parker is played by Chris Marshall who played Colin in Love Actually, which is an amazing Christmas movie, one of my favorites. The first male attention Charlotte receives is from Sir Edward Denham. Immediately, no. I didn't trust him from the get-go. He made my skin crawl, and it turns out later on my instincts were correct. He's a terrible person. We meet Tom's sister, Diana Parker, and I really liked her. She seems bubbly and sweet. She lives with their brother, Arthur, who is so dramatic going on and on about how ill he feels and talking about how they've been walking for so long he really needs to get in out of the howling gale referring to the strong wind i'm gonna use howling gale from now on i love that <laughs> sandyton is a seaside town so of course we have a trip to the beach early on. The men just like strip down right there on the beach, swim naked. The women have to go into wooden dressing rooms and put on red swimming caps and matching dresses with long sleeves. Both things make me uncomfortable. So I'm glad we have a happy medium now. Like, I don't want to see people naked. That's like where I draw the line. The dresses and long sleeves and things, I know there's different like types of modest swimsuits. I like to be a little more covered up at the beach. That's all fine. It's just the nudity when you contrast that with what the women have to wear and it's like no. Okay. But I'm glad everyone's having fun. That's great. Sydney Parker, the fourth and final Parker sibling. Uh yeah. <laughs> Played by Theo James. I already know he's the main love interest. I know what's gonna happen between him and Charlotte. It's headed for doom. I don't want to get attached. Guys, I did my best. I tried. I really tried. <clears throat> Sir Edward and his cousin Clara. Uh, at first Clara seemed fine, like she could be a good friend for Charlotte, but her and Edward are caught in a physical entanglement in the woods. They're cousins, and I know that was normal back then. It's not for me. 
it's not for me, okay? First vibes from Charlotte and Sydney together. It's giving me Mr. Tilney and Catherine vibes from North Anger Abbey. Let me just stop right here and tell you, there are quite a few things in this show that remind me of other Jane Austen stories and adaptations. I don't know if that's intentional. Even if it's not, I don't want to know because it makes me feel giddy as a Jane Austen fan. <laughs> like, let me just have this excitement. Anyone else see the similarity? Obviously, Sydney is much more serious than Mr. Tilney. He's kind of a mix between Mr. Tilney and Darcy. Charlotte's naivety matches that of Catherine, and then Sydney's worldly experience and more mature outlook on things resembles that of Mr. Tilney. Now we're at episode two. We start with the minister's sermon about women being lovely flowers that are meant to bloom and wait to be plucked, meaning waiting for a man to propose and marry them. Uh, it's a bold, bold choice for a sermon. Uh, once again, not for me. Uh, no, not the words I would use. Okay, Clara and Edward. Charlotte saw them in the woods. She didn't really know what she was watching. They both talked to her separately. And here's what's interesting. Clara is claiming that Edward's taking advantage of her. Edward's claiming that Clara is not as innocent as she seems and she's taking advantage of him. I don't trust either of them and I feel like both of them are using each other because both of them don't have money. Clara wants to be with Edward because he's trying to inherit his aunt Lady Denham's money. So she thinks she can entrap him in a marriage and then have that money by association. I think he's just using her for his own physical pleasure because like I don't think he actually likes her. It just the whole thing is very toxic. Charlotte and Tom meet with his foreman, young James Stringer. He is so cute. <laughs> so cute and uh yeah I immediately shipped him with Charlotte which goes against the whole Sydney thing but I was I was looking for a straw to grasp but then I couldn't help it I googled him emotional damage like immediately the actor has scheduling conflicts and cannot be in season two or season three so I don't think they're gonna wait that long to give Charlotte a love interest obviously he's off the table that sucks oh god second broken heart I love that for me so Edward is not only doing this weird physical thing with his cousin he's doing a weird physical thing with his sister esther yup yeah mm. please tell me we're not headed in the incest direction like what is this flowers in the attic game of thrones absolutely not i didn't sign up for this miss georgiana lamb is now in town she is an heiress from antigua and she's getting a lot of money so a lot of men want to marry her the character seemed very cold to me at first. She had up a lot of walls. I wasn't really sure how I felt about her. I was leaning towards not liking her. But then Lady Denham threw a luncheon and pineapple testing claiming it was in her honor and to make her feel more at home. And then she made really inappropriate comments about Georgiana and slavery and I suddenly understood why Georgiana is the way she is. Like I cringed just thinking about the comments and behavior she's had to endure. She does not want to be in Sanditon. She wants to go back to London. She tries to sneak away from the house where she's staying, sneak away from the lady who's taking care of her and take a carriage to London. The driver doesn't believe that she has money because she doesn't carry the money. It's in a bank in London. So she says she'll pay him when they get there. He doesn't believe her. He's laughing at her. And then a crowd gathers and starts to handle her physically. So she runs away and Charlotte finds her on a cliff at the beach. And thankfully she showed up because she is in tears and I feel like she was about to make a very rash decision. Charlotte's there to comfort her and they really seem to get along. I'm just glad that now she has a genuine friend 
to lean on. I don't want to say my feelings changed towards her. I want to say I just got to know her more. Yeah, that feels, that feels better. Uh, Sydney, good lord. I am trying so hard not to get attached. It's like picking a car in a race knowing the car's gonna crash, but you're still cheering it on. Like, make it, make it make sense. It doesn't. Oh, God. What is it about brooding male leads in period dramas? It's so hard not to root for them. Exhibit A, Mr. Darcy. Well, okay, episode three. Esther Denham is obviously doing something with her brother, right? But she has an admirer in Lord Babington. And honestly, I ship them. He genuinely likes her and wants to be with her. She is being so rude to him and I hope that has a happy ending. I really do. Uh, by the way, like obviously I already know how these things end. I'm reading the notes in my head how I was writing them, if that makes sense. Why is this girl asking questions when she already knows what happens? I'm reading them as if like I'm in the moment, okay? Just let me live. Sydney is growing very annoyed because Charlotte keeps showing up wherever he is, at other people's homes, at his brother Tom's office, the beach where he's swimming. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hilarious. And don't get attached, don't get attached. Dr. Fuchs. I won't say the first joke that popped into my head, okay? He is played by Adrian Scarborough, who played Charlie on Miranda. Wanted to mention that because I freaking love Miranda. Arthur and Diana, brother and sister, quite a pair. They were honestly meant to be roommates as adults because I think the correct word for them is hypochondriac. Constantly listing off all the things that are ailing them. They don't need WebMD, they are internally WebMD. They just like, they have everything. They freak out about the tiniest thing and it's, <laughs> it is hilarious. It's hilarious. Dr. Fuchs goes to Lady Denim's house to put on a demonstration. Tom really wants her to approve of him as the resort's main physician. Clara takes Edward aside to you know, work on her seduction. She tells him, I know you think of me. And he says to her face, mm, I literally never think of you. She has to reconfigure, right? Lady Denim is about to throw out Dr. Fuchs and he begs for a second chance. He wants to show off his hydrotherapy sauna. Ask for a volunteer and Clara volunteers. She gets into the tub. She's using this shower head that has a really lovely warm temperature. She says it's working perfectly fine. No one can see her because there's a curtain. She gets the brilliant idea to put her bare arm on the boiler, I guess, or water heater. Guys, she doesn't even react to the heat. She holds it there for seconds. Like it feels like an eternity. She waits, collects herself, and then screams bloody murder and it works because Edward runs straight to her. So, yeah, not believing the whole I never think of you thing. Clara and Edward are obviously joined in a love triangle by Esther because Edward's doing his thing with Clara and doing his thing with Esther. It's making Clara and Esther rivals. At this point, Esther knows about Clara. Clara doesn't know about Esther. But there's still this rivalry and this jealousy going on and it's like brutal. They're going for the jugular. They do not like each other. They're doing their best to ruin the other one in the eyes of Lady Denim. Clara doesn't want Esther to look good in the eyes of her aunt so she doesn't get any money. Esther wants Clara to get kicked out of Lady Denim's house so she doesn't get anywhere near the money. Like, it's so catty and petty. Whoo, a lot of drama. When Isaac Stringer, James Stringer's father, is injured at the construction site, Charlotte's quick thinking reminded me so much of Anne Elliot in Persuasion. And then Sydney tells her he was so impressed by her. She didn't bat an eyelash at the blood. She did everything she could to help stop the bleeding 
and she helped the doctor while he was setting the leg and all of that. Like, so reminiscent of Anne Elliot and Captain Wentworth. And I loved it. Obviously, that tells us Sydney is warming to Charlotte and they're having this like banter now back and forth. How oh, they argue, but then they have a sweet moment, but then they argue. Ugh. I can't do this, guys. I'm putting myself on the seesaw when I know what's gonna happen. It's like I'm self destructing. Why did I join the Sandy Tins fandom when I knew? I freaking knew. Episode four, Clara's delivering this letter from Lady Denham to the siblings. She knocks on the door, no one answers. It's unlocked, so she walks in and catches the siblings being a lot more chummy than siblings should be. Edward's kissing her neck. It looks like a freaking vampire romance situation. She leaves and no one technically sees her, but Esther heard something. She turns around, walks out, and sees the letter on the table. It has Lady Denham's name on it. She immediately knows it was Clara. Because obviously Lady Denham didn't go over there by herself. This will get very interesting because Esther knew about Clara. Now Clara knows about Esther. It's been mentioned that Miss Lamb was taken away from an unsuitable match in London. We never knew who that was, but now we find out that it is a man named Otis Molyneux. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Molyneux? When her guardian, who is Sydney Parker, leaves town, she's able to meet with Otis in secret. When Sydney left, he trusted Charlotte enough to ask her to keep an eye on Georgiana. Charlotte is very distrusting of Otis at first, but he's so nice that she warms up to him, which is not a good idea. Tom Parker and James Stringer are at odds because he has really mishandled the resort project. He's not supplying enough men to get it done, and he's not paying the men. James Stringer being the foreman, he bears the brunt of the fallout from those poor decisions, and Tom just never really faces him or deals with it, ever. He promises a lot of things and never follows through. So there are odds at this moment. Back to Otis, it's revealed that he was born in Africa and brought to England because of slavery. Miss Lamb has very strong opinions to share with Charlotte. She tells her that Sydney's actually been to Antigua, talking about her own country. He's seen the different trades, such as sugar, that go on there, uh, basically kept running because of slave labor. She flat out tells her, Sydney's seen all that, but he turns a blind eye because there's money to be made. Which is... Now we get to the part where inevitably Sydney comes back early and finds them all. And, oh, he's angry. Charlotte goes to bat for Otis and Georgiana, and it does not work. Her and Sydney have their biggest fight yet. Oh my goodness. Like, he is so angry. And in that moment, I was like, why? What's wrong with Otis? Why is he so angry? Back to the weird love triangle. I guess she's kind of trying to justify their relationship. Esther is always reminding people, I am Edward's stepsister. We are not blood relations. For some people, that might make them a little more comfortable with their relationship. For me, I still find it weird. If you're related to someone through marriage, I still consider that a familial bond, and I can't even fathom any kind of romance. Like, mm, I just can't accept it. Clara has been hinting about what she saw around Esther and basically blackmailing her, you know, letting her know that she knows, and, you know, she could break her silence at any moment and expose them. Finally, Clara confronts her in private and takes a bit of a different approach, kind of 
softening and implying that Edward is taking advantage of Esther and she should stand up for herself then adding that when Clara was young she was taken advantage of by a relative and uncle. Esther is horrified says that is nothing like her situation. Later on we see her loving on Edward, expressing her love for him. Like I said, I feel like he's just using her because he knows how much affection she has for him. He's just using her for his own physical pleasure, honestly. The conversation is so one-sided and it ends with her alone in tears. And I know it's like weird, but I feel for her because I think in her head she thinks like this is genuinely love and she's just being used. I don't know, this is kind of the moment where I slightly feel for her. I'm softening towards her. <laughs> Charlotte is now convinced that Sydney is completely prejudiced, so she is determined to help Georgiana be with Otis. Which brings us to episode 5. She is doing her best to go between the two, sending letters, trying to think of ways that they can meet up. I like Georgiana's character at this point, but I will say she's being so irksome. Charlotte's trying to help her in private, so the- I forget the character who's watching over her, so she won't hear anything, and Georgiana's like speaking out loud on purpose. I know she's so sick of the way she's been treated. I get that and that need to be rebellious, but Charlotte is trying so hard to help her. Like she's going out of her way to help her. Georgiana's going out of her way to be difficult. And it's just like, I, I can't help it. I was so annoyed in this scene. As we learn more about Tom's mishandling of the resort project, we find out it actually has to do with money. He's not paying the workers because he doesn't have the money. And as the project goes on, it's kind of becoming a giant. I think he took on a project that he was hoping would make the town money and make him money. But in reality, he didn't actually have the money to make that project a reality in the first place. Lady Denham is an investor, but she's a very opinionated investor. He can't keep dipping into the well because she's very protective of her money, like I would be too. I don't think she'd be happy to know that her money's going into a project that's not actually thriving at this moment in time, if that makes sense. It's like not knowing that your investment is actually a sinking ship, you know, just to paint a picture. At this point, I have not mentioned Arthur Parker's crush on Georgiana. Yes, that's right. It seems like our young Mr. Parker has a genuine crush on her. She considers him very nice, but obviously she's in love with Otis, so she does not reciprocate these feelings, unfortunately for Mr. Arthur. We now come to the cricket game on the beach. Charlotte and Sydney and Stringer. Oh my, Stringer likes Charlotte. At this point, he's not really aware of her liking Sydney. Sydney mm, hasn't admitted it, but he begrudgingly is starting to like Charlotte. He has noticed Stringer and her when they're together. They have a fun time. They laugh. She doesn't laugh like that with him. This is becoming a love triangle on its own, although like not a strong triangle, but yeah. Ugh. It just all sucks, doesn't it? Tom has an outburst and leaves the cricket game and Charlotte offers to take his place and she kills it. Oh, I loved that part of this scene. I loved that for her. So cool. Clara and Edward have yet another meeting together without people around. I mean, they're at the cricket game, but they're in an isolated tent. No one's being genuine in this relationship and it's so toxic. She's using him, he's using her. She's claiming she knows he thinks about her. I know you're into me, blah, blah, blah. And he's claiming, ugh, I could never, I never think of you. It's just the most toxic thing ever. I can't with them. Like, there's no way it leads to anything, right? Like, no way they could ever last 
in the real world. Esther finally agrees to spend time with Lord Babington, and he shocks us all and proposes on the spot. She actually laughs at him until she realizes he is dead serious. He likes her enough, and at this point, I think he's definitely starting to fall in love with her. He loves her enough to propose right then and there without ever really spending a ton of alone time with her. She is shocked. The scene ends, we don't see an answer right away. Charlotte and Sydney back at the cricket game. Oh God, okay, so they're on the same team. So he has to be rooting for her. He's so impressed by her and they share a look. When I tell you I needed a cold shower afterwards. Oh, I mean, that look could grill steak. Oh, that's gonna hurt. Moving on, moving on. Esther tells Edward about the proposal, and you know what he does? He does what he does best. He distracts her by kissing her. Guys, he's possessive. Like, he keeps telling her they both need to find matches and get married. But here she has a proposal, she brings it to him, and he's like, mm, not that one. And he kisses her, reminding her of, you know, their weird thing going on. This man's a walking red flag. Just when Sydney and Charlotte have taken one step forward, they take five steps back. During the cricket game, Georgiana slips away to meet with Otis. Witnesses say after she waited a couple minutes, she was taken away by two unidentified men in a carriage. They think one of these men might be Otis, but they don't understand why she was taken like that. None of it makes sense. Charlotte was supposed to be with her, but obviously at the last minute she ended up in the cricket game and she totally forgot. Sydney blames her for all of this. He is so angry and she feels terrible which leads to her sneaking away to London on her own to find Georgiana which brings us to episode six. Tom and Mary Parker argue because she finds out that he can't pay his workers. She had no idea about any of that. She's extremely upset. Now Tom is staying in London and he's trying to think of a way to win back his wife's trust. Miss Charlotte arrives in London at night. I hate myself for this but the entire time I was thinking if she finds herself in trouble I really hope Sydney shows up on his white horse. Like girl power yes she doesn't need a man but also uh, <sighs> after the look on the beach I just like needed him to be her knight, okay? Let me live. She does find herself in trouble. A man grabs her. Then an unidentified man shows up, punches this guy, gets him off her, saves the day, and wouldn't you know, knight in shiny armor. <laughs> it's Sydney. No, I didn't just, oh, I just squealed. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. He realizes it's her and he begrudgingly allows her to help him find Georgiana. Turns out Mr. Otis owes a lot of money to the owner of a gambling house. While he was gambling at that establishment, he bragged about being close to marriage with Georgiana and being able to pay off his debts with her money. The owner kidnapped Georgiana gross and get this he sold her to someone to recover the money from otis's debts who are these disgusting people thankfully sydney and charlotte find her before she and her husband-to-be cross the border into scotland she is physically okay but mentally and emotionally not only did she go through a disgusting ordeal, but she now knows about Otis and she's dealing with a broken heart on top of everything else. That's too much for her. Too much. Lady Denham falls ill, which puts our love triangle trio in an interesting position because they don't know what's in her will and all of them want the money. Also, Esther refused Lord Babington's proposal. So 
she doesn't have that going for her. Now they are desperately looking for her will, specifically Edward. Esther actually seems genuinely concerned about her aunt's health. Edward turns on the charm though. He turns on the charm, does what he does best, and persuades her they have to ensure that they get money in her will. Because like that's what's important, right? Esther eventually leaves and Edward and Clara make a deal because she shows up with the will. She found it first. They make a deal to split the money, her getting a fifth of the inheritance, and then they burn the will. In their mind, they're thinking if there's no will, the money will go to the person with the denim title, which would be Edward. So that's why they burn it and they've already agreed on how they'll split the money. So naturally they seal the deal by, you know, sleeping together. And then Clara does what she does best. She turns on him after all that and says she wants more money. And when he's about to refuse, she casually mentions that she knows about him and Esther. And that is how she gets more money. Because he obviously doesn't want it to get out that he's romantically entangled with his sister. Just saying that sentence makes me feel physically ill. Up until now, we knew that Sydney Parker was Georgiana's guardian, but we didn't know why. Apparently, her father saved his life in some way, so when he died, Sydney promised that he would look after Georgiana and her fortune up until she was of age and married. We also find out why Sydney is so cold, especially toward women. At one time, he was engaged to a woman named Eliza. At the last minute, she broke off their engagement to marry someone else. I can't even imagine. Like, it, it left his heart shattered. And <clears throat> gotta love that foreshadowing, right? Yeah. Okay. Moving on. In a moment of redemption in Charlotte's eyes, Sydney allows Otis and Georgiana to see each other and say a proper goodbye. Poor, poor Georgiana is so heartbroken by what Otis did. She doesn't trust him enough to believe anything he says. Even when he says that he never ever cared about her fortune, he loved her for her, he fell in love with her soul. I think he did like her but it's so hard, you know, when you find out that someone has gambling debts and they were bragging about using your fortune to pay off those debts. Like, how are you supposed to believe he didn't actually care about the money and he loved her? <sighs> it sucks. Charlotte, at the masquerade ball in London, meets a lady named Susan. When I heard the name, I immediately thought, this has got to be inspired by Jane Austen's novella, Lady Susan. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but like, let's just pretend it is because I think that's cool. <clears throat> I can't even talk. Charlotte and Sydney dance at the ball. When I tell you I felt like my throat was closing up, I could not breathe. I was gasping for air with a capital G. Oh, I had chills. Actually, I have chills now just remembering. Oh, it was so reminiscent of Lizzie and Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. Oh. <laughs> oh god, okay, here we go. Sydney recognizes a woman at the ball. He walks up to her. He calls her Mrs. Campion. Campion? Campion? I think he pronounced it Campion. Anyways, uh, we find out very quickly, Miss Ma'am is Eliza. And guess what? She's now a widow. She's no longer married. Single and ready to mingle and very much looking at Sydney with wanting eyes. You should see Charlotte's face. Like, it broke my heart. This is the beginning of the end. Here we go. Episode 7. Oh, I hate it. Okay, so Eliza shows up in Sandy Tin for the regatta. Yay. Woohoo. Like, I literally hate her. If you think that's harsh, just wait. We once again see Sydney swimming at the beach. No one's complaining. Uh, 
I know I'm not crazy. When he gets out of the water, he's definitely looking around, hoping to see Charlotte again. Like, he's 100% looking around. But we're not gonna dwell because <laughs> this doesn't have a happy ending, does it? <sighs> At the regatta, Charlotte and Eliza finally me. Yeah, I'm, guys, I'm not biased in this situation, I swear. Eliza's not nice. I mean, like, sh she's polite, but you can tell when she sees how beautiful Charlotte is. Who's that? What does she do? Oh, she's cute. Like, no, I don't like her. A woman named Lady Worcester? I think that's how you say it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, R. Worcester. Lady Worcester. Who knew? W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R. -E Worcestershire. <laughs> no, it's not even the same word. No, you actually pronounce it Worcester. So Lady Worcester shows up. It's actually Susan. Turns out she's a very influential lady in society, specifically London society. She has a connection to the monarchy. She was very charmed by Charlotte and showed up to the regatta because Charlotte mentioned it. And her presence means a bunch of London people followed her, which means the regatta turned out to be a huge success for Tom and his resort. Susan is so sweet. She wants to help Charlotte win Sydney's heart and beat out her rival Eliza because she immediately clocks what's going on with Miss Mam over there. Fun fact about Susan, she's actually played by someone who's in the royal family. Sophia Winkleman, who is married to Lord Frederick Windsor, son of Prince Michael of Kent, cousin of Queen Elizabeth, as in the current Queen Elizabeth. Lady Denham is still very ill. They're not even sure at this point that she'll survive the night. Esther goes in to be with her. She is sobbing and she talks about Clara and Edward and their scheme, what they're doing. Lady Denham, being the woman that she is, she wakes up on the mend. Fever broken, never felt better. She immediately disowns Edward and sends Clara packing back to London and expresses that Esther might become her sole heir. It's just done, just like that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called karma. Charlotte and Eliza interact again. Sydney and Susan are there. It's like Eliza knows her history with Sydney, gives her the upper hand over Charlotte in some way. I can see her having this attitude and she's kicking Charlotte while she's down, if that makes sense. And I just don't like that. She brings up romance in a way that's like, oh, is there a boy in your village that you're interested in? Like, oh, no one here would interest you. I'm sure like our society talk bores you, blah, blah, blah. And then she tries to get Sydney to agree. I just hate her. Charlotte ends up running away from the conversation near tears because of Eliza's comments about her being from a small town and a reader and just like the implications of her comments. Sydney goes after her and tries to smooth things over. You can just see the hurt on Charlotte's face. Like, it breaks my heart just thinking about it. And she basically just tells him, like, just, just leave me alone. Uh, excuse me. Stop. Wait, 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 wait. I can hear Well. I hope you weren't too offended by Mrs. Campion. Later on when the boat race starts, Charlotte ends up 
right beside Eliza and they're talking about who they want to win. Eliza's cheering on Sydney, of course. <laughs> Charlotte is cheering on James Stringer publicly and loudly. She wants Sydney to know. She probably shouldn't be using Stringer in this way, but here we are. And this is what Eliza says when they're talking about who they want to win. I don't see the point in entering a race if you're not going to win. She says that very pointedly at Charlotte and I don't think she's referring to the boat race. She's referring to Sydney. She's talking about entering the race for his heart. She would never enter a race if she wasn't going to win and she thinks she's gonna win. Oh that sealed it for me. I'm going to hate her for eternity. I feel for James Stringer. He genuinely likes Charlotte and she likes him, just not in the way he wants her to like him. And I feel bad because he's caught in the middle at this point. I don't want anything to overshadow the fact that he is also going to leave this situation with a broken heart. Esther cuts off Edward. She doesn't want to be around him. She doesn't want to live with him anymore. We're done. She finds herself once more in the presence of Lord Babington, Lady Denham is really encouraging her to go for it with him. There's a spark of hope for them. I'm really rooting for them because this could be her actual happy ending and like we need some happy ending in all of this. Oh god, okay. God. This is how the episode ends, right? Sydney shows up and tells Charlotte that he chose not to accompany Eliza back to London. He then tells her he is his best and truest self when he's with her. If you're looking for your brother... I'm not. As a matter of fact, I was looking for you. I thought you and Mrs. Campion would be heading back to London. She's already left. I decided against joining her. On reflection, I realized I would rather be here. I, you know, I'm a great deal less than perfect. He's made me all too aware of that. But for whatever it's worth, I believe I am my best self. Don't say it. My truest self. Don't say it. Well, I'm with you. Don't say it. <laughs> that is all. When this happened in real time, I wanted to feel nothing. And instead, I was feeling all the pain. How do you end episode 7, the second to last episode, with that quote? Sydney saying to Charlotte, I am my truest self when I'm with you. You know what? I get it. The creator, Andrew, is a sick man. A sick, twisted man. Episode 8. Here we go. Strap in, folks. The episode starts with Georgiana asking if Charlotte is in love with Sydney. She's in complete shock. And then she tells her, don't believe a word he says. Oh my god. We're off to a great start. The carriage scene with Esther and Lord Babington. Lady Denham encourages... Esther to accept Lord Babington's invitation. So she goes on a carriage ride with him. Guys, she ends up laughing out loud with him. They're riding along on the beach. She's actually like smiling and having fun and it is so refreshing to see her character in that light. <sighs> High hopes for that couple. High hopes. Sydney and Charlotte go on a walk together and it is so adorably awkward. I'm sorry for using that adjective I hate myself for, but it is. It's adorably awkward. And then they kiss. 
they kiss. And I have chills just thinking about it. It's like adorable and uh, I don't want to feel. I want to go numb. I really do. You know something that we like. Find a moment where we could be alone together. Hi. Yes. I woke up this morning. We're headed since that conversation we had last night. So did I. Young James Stringer and his dad have an argument. He was offered an apprenticeship in London, which is something he's been wanting for so long. He wants to be an architect, do his own work. His father does not approve. They leave on very bad terms. His dad still working at the construction site and James going to the ball. At the ball, Stringer asks Charlotte to dance. At this point, he knows that her and Sydney are in a very good place and he tells her he accepts that and he wishes her all the happiness in the world. He's so brave to do this. We need to acknowledge that he is also getting his heart broken on this show. The things that happen in the end with Sydney and Charlotte and the way Charlotte feels, we need to remember that James is also going through a similar thing. Watching someone he really likes and potentially loves choose someone else we just oh we need to remember that like my heart goes out to him it does oh lord sydney and charlotte finally have a moment together on the same balcony where they were in was it episode one or two they actually had their first argument on that balcony it seems like sydney's about to propose and he's interrupted by Edward, who bursts in. At last. Thought I'd never get you alone. Do you remember the last conversation we had on this balcony? Well, she will. What a brute I was. I deserved everything you said. No, you didn't. I hope that I'm a different man now. No. You're the same man, but much improved. If I have changed at all, it isn't no small part down to you. I have never wanted to put myself in someone else's power before. I've never wanted to care for anyone but myself. I'm breaking. I'm breaking. I say what? I hope your seatbelt is secure because the roller coaster has reached the top. It's now about to descend. He bursts in and spills the beans about having a relationship with his sister Esther. Everyone is shocked, right? Like, obviously. Surprisingly, though, their aunt, Lady Denham, doesn't judge Esther in the slightest, which I think is really nice. I think she actually feels for her because she understands that she got caught up in this infatuation. Obviously, like in my head, it's not right, but this is probably one of the only moments where I truly like Lady Denim because I think she's actually looking out for Esther, and that's why she's encouraging her match with Lord Babington. She wants Esther to get a happy ending. I don't know, it's just the way I felt. Esther rejects Edward, tells him to get out, then, in private, accepts Lord Babington's proposal. Yay! <laughs> it made me so happy. Uh, yeah, okay. Still descending, a fire breaks out at the construction site, and unfortunately, Mr. Stringer 
is killed, James Stringer's father. And of course, their last interaction was a fight. <sighs> Poor James. First a broken heart, now his father dies, and it seems like that's the only family he has. He's heartbroken, and he also decides not to take the apprenticeship in London and stay in Sandyton and help with the rebuilding. He's at least going to stay until that project's done. Obviously, we know now that the actor's not coming back, so that's great. I, I just hate that the show ended with him saying he's staying. Like, that gives me hope, but then it's like, oh, that's right. The actor can't come back, so that meant nothing in season one. Great. Turns out Tom Parker never insured the construction work because he couldn't afford it. Very heartbreaking, considering the town of Sandyton and the new resort were finally getting buzz thanks to Lady Susan. Lady Denham is furious because she put in most of the money to fund this project. Now, Sydney is going out of town to try and save the day, figure out a way to get them funding, something, because they don't have insurance, they're going to have to pay out of their own pockets to rebuild, and they've already put in so much money. <sighs> he promises Charlotte he will be back very soon and that they will finish their conversation. That is not what happens. Let me take a moment, because this is it, folks. We've reached it. When Sydney comes back, he has saved Sandyton and the resort. But the way he did that was agreeing to marry Eliza, who has money. You can tell he's very upset when he tells Charlotte, but nothing prepares you for Charlotte looking him in the eye with tears, saying, I understand, I wish you all the happiness in the world, and then running away to her room and sobbing. It was so well done because I felt it in my gut. I felt it in my heart. I felt like I was hurt in that moment. I was sobbing. Oh, Alison, it is possible that my future too could rest on Sydney's swift return. Wish I could tell you more, but it may be that very soon I will have the most exciting news to share. This is excellent news. There's very little time left. I think this is it. I think this is it. Charlotte Corey has been standing to his safe. Oh, that's wonderful. Come along, everyone. He's not. We must go and tell Lady Denham immediately. Send it! Is it? Charlotte. My dear Charlotte. No, no, no. I don't. When I returned, I won't be able to make you a proposal of marriage. But I can't be. Why? Why won't I? Why? Why? The fact is, I have been obliged to engage myself to Mrs. Eliza Campion. Please believe me, there's never any other way to resolve Tom's situation. I understand. Oh, I can't face you. I have anything to do. I'm going to save my rant for the end, but I have one. I have one. Actually, I'll say this one thing. I don't understand. How was this the way to save his brother's project and his town? How was marrying Eliza the one and only way to do this? He literally 
gave Charlotte his heart. It was so obvious. He never proposed, but it was so obvious where he was going. And then he does this. And don't give me the BS excuse about duty. There was definitely more than one way to save the project. And it's just so ridiculous that this is how Sydney handled things. Furious with a capital F. <sighs> Happy thoughts because we see Lord Babington marry Esther. I am genuinely so happy they ended up together because she, in the final episode, is the happiest we've seen her in the entire season. I am so happy for them. Like, I, oh, I'm glad we got one happy ending. <laughs> At the wedding, Eliza purposefully goes on and on about wedding plans in front of Charlotte. I want to claw her eyes out. Once again, kicking Charlotte when she's already down. This poor girl has had her heart shattered. Eliza is stepping on the pieces and grinding them into dust. Why? She won. She got Sydney. Charlotte makes the decision to leave. She is on her way out of town in a carriage when someone stops the carriage. One last moment of heartbreak. Sydney doesn't want her to leave without him saying goodbye. Also, he needs her to know he doesn't love Eliza. He loves only her. He loves Charlotte. Sydney loves Charlotte. I've, I've never... Oh, God. Charlotte does the sweetest thing and tells him not to talk like that. Don't think like that. You made a promise. You need to hold up your end of the bargain, your end of the proposal, and then she leaves. No. No. You must try to make her happy. Yes. Yes, you are. I have to fulfill my side of the bargain. Why? Why, Charlotte? I wish you every happiness. I honestly think that poking my own eyes out with a fork would hurt less than this show. Time to rant. You ready? I don't like how Sydney handled this. I've read Jane Austen. I've never read Sandy Tin, and obviously it's unfinished, so we don't know how Jane Austen would have ended it. But the way her other stories ended, the math is not mathing. <laughs> I don't get why they decided to do it like this. After the first season, the show got canceled. Fans were devastated, especially after that horrible ending. Then, unexpectedly, 
they brought it back and said there would be at least a season two and a season three. This is fantastic. What's going to happen? Oh, wait. Theo James puts out a statement saying he only ever intended to film season one. He likes the way he ended because he likes the creative direction. He likes that it didn't have your typical fairy tale ending. He likes that creative choice and he wants to leave it at that. He will not be returning. Okay, I not only hate Sidney Parker, I hate Theo James for this. He has a right to his opinion. He can like creative choices. That's great. I don't agree. I'm speaking as a consumer. In period dramas where there are two main characters that sizzle like this on screen, I don't mind drama. I don't mind ups and downs. But this total and just utter heartbreak, I don't like it. I'm sorry. It's not for me. This is not why I watch things like this. I watch for the happy endings. I don't put on Pride and Prejudice because... <laughs> Darcy breaks Lizzie's heart. I put it on for the serotonin, okay? When I am feeling down in the dumps, I need that movie to speak to my soul and revive me. If I want to feel dead, I'll just play Sandington season one episode eight. Yes, it's different and unique, but I don't think it's good. They're not the only ones getting their hearts broken. I'm the kind of viewer, I feel what they're feeling. When I watch a period drama, I'm expecting drama, but the main couple, I'm not expecting them to break up in the most horrific way. He loves Charlotte, but marries Eliza to save a building, a resort. Like, that's the only option he had. That is not the only option. In my eyes, he broke our heart for no good reason. And that I cannot agree with. If that's truly the ending they stand by for Sydney and Charlotte, I just don't like the writing on that. I don't. Also, if that's truly the Sydney that we're gonna get, maybe Sydney's not that great a character. Like, you can't help swooning over him the entire time, but at the end of the day, he broke her heart to marry the girl that broke his heart. Eliza broke off their engagement to marry someone else. And now, Sydney has broken Charlotte's heart to marry someone else. Eliza, the girl that did that to him. And he didn't marry her for a good reason. And he admits to Charlotte that he only loves her, not Eliza. Like, that makes everything okay. How does that help? How does him stopping her carriage out of town help when that's what he's gonna tell her? Oh, Charlotte, I know I broke your heart and I'm marrying this other girl, but, like, I only love you. But you're still marrying her. I'm sorry. I don't like that creative choice. I don't like Sydney Parker. And I don't like Theo James. <laughs> I don't like him for leaving. I don't like him for what he said. He has the right to do all of the above, but I hate him for literally all of it. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel. <sighs> we have to do one last thing. We have to react to the trailer for season two, which I'm going to be doing weekly videos on. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Here's the thing. I want Charlotte to have her happy ending, but it was so crushing at the end of season one. She had so much chemistry with Sydney. It's going to be an uphill battle for sure. And let me tell you, I've seen at least one of her potential suitors from season two, and I'm not impressed. No offense. I'm very picky. Okay, let's watch the trailer, because I'm rambling at this point, and I am so emotionally drained. Like, I'm, I'm so tired. I've been watching Sanditon all day, knowing what was going to happen, and I reacted ten times worse than I thought I was going to react really love that for me on the weekend. I do. I'm also getting really hot in this. I just hate everything. Oh. The trailer is only a minute long. Thank God. I don't think I could endure three minutes. Here we go. Play. I just want to see you happy again, Charlotte. Is that so wrong? I'm trying to forge a new life, mm -hmm. a new path. And we're all rooting oh, for you. Foot and sand to fall in love on the spot. Was that your experience, Miss <sighs> Hayward? 
Mm, May I no. introduce my dear friend, Mr. Lockhart. A hundred soldiers, Charlotte. I have a plan for us both to find husbands here in Sanderton. You remain stubbornly unwed, I see. I believe independence is something to be encouraged. Oh, don't be absurd. <laughs> Mr. Lockhart, what do you want from me? Isn't that obvious? I will not let you destroy my oh, reputation. He's after I her. Watching you like a I should then. I am besieged no, by fortune hunters. Just is that an hour? When is I he back? Him. Do you, are you dreaming of? Love is not as simple as you seem to think. Why should it not be? Sanditon, Sunday, March 20th, only on PBS. Mm. Guys, I'm in a terrible state to be reacting to this. I didn't like the look of any of those men. I didn't see one Mr. Darcy or Captain Wentworth or Mr. Tilney. Actually, since I don't like the look of any of them, I'm kind of hoping she doesn't meet anyone in this season. Like, that's... Let's keep looking for the right man, okay? I should probably say goodbye. I've sa said a lot of things. I've said a lot of things. I just really want to be locked in a room with Andrew Davies and Theo James. Like, I just want to talk. I realize that <laughs> the last thing you want is for me to talk some more, but I have two really, really important things to say. Number one, I discovered an article from a few years ago that was published before Sandy Tim was canceled, then renewed, and before Theo James left the show. I would like to issue an apology to the creative team because in this article, one of the writers or producers says that that ending was not final. That was not the ending they intended for Sydney and Charlotte. They wanted to entice viewers to come back because this was their chance to make something different. Before this, there had never been a Jane Austen TV show, only movies and miniseries. This was their chance to create a world inspired by Jane Austen and keep it going. They wanted to leave you heartbroken and needing more needing a better ending. When this writer or producer was asked, when the show comes back, are you intending for Sydney and Charlotte to end up together? She says, oh, 100% yes. Sydney is the hero. He will find a way. I am so tired. Don't tell me that. This makes me angry because now we come to the issue of Theo James leaving. I don't think there's enough communication about this. Obviously, the cancellation created some problems because the show didn't come back four years after the first season. By then, actors have moved on. I understand that. However, Theo James made it clear he never intended to film more than one season. He was obviously on a completely different page from the creative team, and I don't like that. They created something so beautiful, and they intended to see it through. And then the cancellation happened, it threw everything off, and Theo James left when it was renewed. But then, going by his statement, he was never intending to stay. I, it's just like, make it make sense. It makes me happy that they wanted a happy ending, you know? But also, it just sort of re-breaks my heart because the circumstances and Theo James' unwillingness <laughs> to give us a happy ending with this beautiful on-screen pairing, I don't get it. I was so exhausted when I watched the trailer and completely missed that the way they wrote Sydney off the show was by killing him. There's a moment when Arthur, I believe, and Charlotte are talking about his death and his grave. They also hint at the fact, don't do this, they hint at the fact that no body was found. Mm. Theo James 
never wanted to continue. He said he won't be back for seasons two or three. But obviously, okay, maybe it's not obvious, but it, it seems like the creative team left a little teeny tiny door open because yes, Sydney is dead. But they're like, oh yeah, there's no body. So if the show continues past season three and they're able to convince him to come back, I don't care if it takes three seasons. I will watch and devour it if they fix it and Sydney and Charlotte end up together. I don't care if she's the only character on the show that doesn't get married in the next two seasons. I do not care. This is a pipe dream and I need to stop. All I'm saying is the creative team sly. Why would they do the whole there was no body thing? I'm just saying. Why would they do that? They're leaving the door open just in case. That's all I'm saying. Okay, we're done. I would really love to know in the comments down below, what did you think of season one? Do you agree with my opinions? Let's discuss. If you enjoyed this long-winded video about Sandyton season one, I appreciate you. Please give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that red button down below to subscribe and become a member of my YouTube family. Also, click the bell to turn on your notifications. Click the link down below to become a patron and financially support future content. There are 10 tiers to choose from, something for every budget. My comment section is always open and video suggestions from you are always welcome. I will see you in my next video. Bye.